Monas Prabhai is a very, very famous investor. He has become friends with Charlie Munger and Warren Buffett. He wrote a book called The Dando Investor that I've read. Good book. It's very simple, but it's a great read. And that's what I like about it. So we interviewed him last December and our interviews were very popular. They're in our library on YouTube. And he was a great guy, invited us to his office. It was great because we reached out to him and um, he reacted very well immediately. And we said, hey, you know, that was a very quick. He's like, yeah, because I watched your videos and you guys get it. You're not just these people trying to get clicks and all this stuff. He's like, you get value investing. So that was very nice to hear. Um, so this is an interview that he did very recently. And we're going to watch about seven minutes of it total. And this is reactions. People love our reaction videos. Uh, sometimes we take reaction videos where we're bashing people. Sometimes it's very positive ones like we by Peter Lynch and things like that. So let's watch this Monish video and get the reaction from me. So I'm gonna press play here. Pretty much any criteria you set could work. I think the important thing is that one is very focused in what one is looking for and has clarity of what one is looking for. I've come to the conclusion, and it's actually a pretty, you know, it took me a long time to figure this out, but I think for most of you, it would, would seem obvious, is if there is such a thing as a best approach out of all of these approaches, the best approach, I think, would be one where one focuses on multi-baggers, you know, businesses that can be a 10x in 10 years or less, or maybe a 100x in 20 years or less. If one focused purely on the multi-baggers, there are some advantages that come up with that approach. One advantage is that one doesn't have much in terms of taxes. So what he's talking about here is, and this is, a, you know, I think that a lot of value investors go through certain different processes in their, you know, Warren Buffett started with, let me find the cigar butts. I'm going to find the companies that are absolute crap companies, but they have assets that are really good. And back in the day when there wasn't the internet, and a lot of things, you could find these, you know, these cigar butts, like something with a company that was declining, but still spitting off cash flow and maybe had a portfolio of stocks that were really good. He's talking about multi-baggers, which is what Warren Buffett, after he met Charlie Munger, came into. And the same thing with me. I used to want to buy companies that were just mispriced. Okay, there's a lot of value here for the temporary, but once it hits its price, I'm out. The multi-bagger approach is more of the growth investing approach. And remember, value investing is applied to growth investing. I don't think they're separate things. You apply value investing to growth. In our software, our software has a stock analyzer tool that allows people to determine a price for the company. The very first line, revenue growth. I say this till I'm blue in the face. If I knew a company was going to grow 20% a year versus another company that's growing 0% a year and everything else is the same, earnings per share is the same, the balance sheet, which one would I pay more for? I would be stupid to say they're the same price. No, one can grow 20% a year and the other one can grow, isn't going to grow. Of course, I would pay a lot more for the 20% per year growth. And that's what he's talking about here. Finding companies that have a lot of growth potential that can compound on itself and grow into 10, 20, 30, or 100 times over the next couple of decades. And this is an approach that I've started to get used to. I've always told people, I have a list of 15 or 20 companies that I would love to own, that I think have a lot of growth potential and can compound on itself, but I gotta pay the right price. And that's the key here. The key is paying the right price for a company that has a lot of growth potential. Now, I have found that you've gotta wait for the market in general to be down a lot. Because of those companies that have good growth, they tend to be popular companies, popular brands. So it's hard to get them at good, cheap values unless the entire market is down and people in general don't like stocks, which has been very, very difficult over the last five years. So let's continue on. Because you'll be holding businesses for a long time under most jurisdictions around the world until the positions are sold, unrealized gains are not taxed. So basically it gives you an advantage and depending on the place on the planet that you practice this, you know, sometimes the tax rates can be as high as, you know, 40, 50%. Deferring that for decades or let's say 10 years or more is a huge advantage because you get a free uh, interest-free loan from the government. So, so there's an advantage in terms of uh, taxes with this approach. The second advantage is that 
you don't have this continuous treadmill of needing to, you know, find something undervalued, then it gets, you know, fairly valued. And, and Brilliant. It's exactly it. So 100% he's right. If you're looking at the approach of the cigar butts, finding one-off companies, wait till they get their value and sell, you're going to do a lot of work. But if you find a great company at a reasonable price and let it compound, you bought it. Well, how often are you check in on it? Every so often. When I say every so often, a couple times a year, just make sure it's still, the thesis is the same, the balance sheet's still similar, the business outlook is the, is the same. Other than that, what are you doing? But if you're trying to buy companies that have the potential of you buy them for 20 because they're worth 40 or 50 and you're waiting, for, you have to constantly, hey, am I still right? Is it still going here? Is it still correct? That's the issue. So just to recap, what is a multi-bagger? A multi-bagger is basically a company that can go up multiple times. Now, Peter Lynch, I think it was Peter Lynch who kind of coined the phrase of a multi-bagger. So if you say it's a four-bagger, you bought it at 20, it went to 80. It went up four times. 10-bagger, you bought it at 20, went to 200. That's the multi-bagger approach, is finding a company that can compound on itself, keep increasing its revenue and profit, keep making its balance sheet better, and therefore, the stock price goes up and up and up and up. And when it's toured out, but if you bought it for 20, at two hundred dollars a share, if it goes up ten percent, you got another one bag on there. So that's the idea of the multi bagger. So let's continue on with the video. We have about one. We have about two more minutes left in this first portion. And then you go look for something else. So the multi bagger, the multi bagger approach to investing has a few quirks, and it requires us to kind of change our mindset on a few fronts. So one of the one of the changes one has to make is that you know traditionally traditionally when one looks at what Ben Graham kind of the you know father of value investing taught us is that you buy something for well below what it's worth and then as it approaches fair value you sell the position and then you so before he goes any further this is something I've struggled with. And a lot of people in our community ask the question, Paul, when do I sell something? You know, I look at Costco. Charlie Munger, who's one of his good friends, has Costco. Costco hit $600 a share. And at the time, I think I valued it at like high 100s. He still owned it. And I was like, man, why does he still own it? That's the hard part. If you're, if you're big in the multi-bagger and buying good businesses at a good price, at what point do you sit there and say, listen, this is insane. $600 a share for a company that's not growing fast. And I think it's worth over high hundreds. That's the question you have to add. That's the hard part of investing. That's what makes investing an art. Now, if he had some major company that he could buy at a major discount and he needed that cash, it's a lot easier. But if you don't, what do you do? Do you sell the company and take your profits, pay your taxes and move on? Or do you keep the company and just say, listen, it's still a great company. Yeah, it might take three or four years to fall. But in that time, instead of being a $180, $200 company, it might be a $350 or $400 company. So really, it's not that big of a deal. That's the hard part about investing. And that's what he's getting into here. And really pay attention to this because this is something that every value investor, unless you have $100 billion like Warren Buffett in the bank, is going to worry about. Warren Buffett can sit there and say, I'm okay because I have so much cash. It's not like I'm deploying that cash anyhow. So I'd rather just ride it out. And go look at Warren's stocks this year. His holdings, his stock holdings are down pretty much with the market, 20%. So he's going to decide. And I'm quite sure if he looked at all the stock holdings, he probably wouldn't say they're all value plays. I'm sure he's like, yeah, these are a little frothy. He's probably not adding a ton to them. But if the stocks go down, he's probably going to add more. So let's continue on. But in, a, in the multi-bagger framework, what you would do is you would actually not particularly care if a position became fully valued. Or, or even overvalued. So, for example, if, if you bought, you know, a business for 30, 40 cents on the dollar and it's growing, that dollar is growing. And at some point it's worth a dollar fifty, for example. It's gone up more than 50% over what it used to be worth. But the stock is trading at $2, for example. So under traditional Grammian approaches, you would sell that as you get past the dollar fifty or whatever. But in in the quest for multi-baggers, you would continue to keep it in your portfolio 
even when it became overvalued. So from my perspective, and that's pretty much that, that segment, from my perspective, one of the things that's allowed me to do this is I've, I've now learned how to sell puts to generate income on my cash. So I'm not as afraid to have cash sitting around and to hold good stocks for a long period of time. And again, I have, a, I have a list of 15 or 20 really great brands that I want to own at the right price. But I got to start owning them at the right price. And this is the issue that you have to deal with. If you're in it for multi-baggers, you really can't jump in and out, jump up in and out. Because there might be times when you buy it and you're, you own it for less than a year. when well, you're going to pay normal income tax rates on that one. And that's going to really hurt your returns. So that's the hard part here. So let's fast forward to the next segment for Monish. In, in the case of the multi-bagger framework, there are just three things that matter. And then the fourth is the price, obviously. So if a business doesn't generate high returns on equity, you're done. You don't need to spend any time on that. If the business needs a lot of debt to grow and generate high returns on equity, you could also be done. You don't even need those. If management quality or ethics is a question, you're also done. You don't need those either. And so just, just if you look at the businesses that generate high returns in equity, that alone would wipe out large swaths of businesses. And then, you know, you get to the runway, right? So DMART will be a lot larger in 10 or 50, 15 years than it is today. I think that's a pretty easy bet to make that the statistically, I think the odds are high that something like DMART might do well. We could make that statement about private sector banks in India. You know, private sector banks in India might be like a third of the banking pie in India today. And maybe in 10 or 20 years, it might be half or two thirds of the pie, for example, and the pie itself might grow. So the, there are there are things that we could hang our hat on and then kind of take it from there. So basically, I think that if you, if you go down this path. So he talks about these four things that matter, high return on equity, um, not a lot of debt, good management and price. Um, you know, return on equity is important. I tend to focus on return on invested capital, which is what kind of return do they get on the capital invested in the business through debt and equity. But I definitely have changed my framework about debt. I used to not care about debt as much, and now I very much do, especially since I've changed my approach to finding longer-term businesses that can hold for a long period of time. Why? Well, debt is going to be the biggest issue with people, and that's why we added enterprise value to our main page because I want to be able to compare market cap to enterprise value because essentially the difference is their net debt. And there are companies, so for Apple, 2.22 trillion to 2.5, not bad. But look at a company like Warner Brothers Media, Warner Brothers Discovery, 24 billion to 107, tons of debt here. So I kind of look at this saying, eh, you know, debt's so scary. It gets people into trouble. I, I want people who are good managers not using leverage to get outsized returns. Do I believe in leverage? Absolutely. Warren Buffett does. That's how he makes his money. When he has insurance companies, he's getting zero interest debt. He gets to borrow the money from the premiums paid. He has to pay it out for the future. And he uses that capital along the way, his float, to go invest at higher rates of return. So he's using debt too, but he's not using egregious debt. You know, in the real estate bubble of 05 and 06, all these developers went under. Why? Because they were 90, 95% leveraged on overpriced assets. I believe in, in leverage. I use it myself. I absolutely use it, but I keep my leverage on my equities to 25%. And right now it's at like 5%. So even I'm not even aggressive when markets are high. So that's the whole key here is being smart about that. When it comes to management, are they ethical? Are they making, are they doing accounting things that are bad? But most importantly to me, are they buying stock back when stock values are high? That to me is a big indicator of this is a management who cares about the investor. If they're buying stock, their, their stock back when the stock value is too high, I'm out. What are you doing? I sold an investment recently, sleep number, because I realized through a friend of mine, he said, have you noticed when they buy back shares? Because they were buying back a lot of shares. I said, this is great. It's cheap. No, they were buying back shares when the stock was really high and they were stopped buying back shares when the stock was low. And I was like, 
I'm out. And I immediately sold. doesn't mean I'm going to ignore the company, but it's not going to be my multi-bagger for me. It's going to be a company that I buy when the cycle is very, very low and it's a short-term play. Because I still like those. When it comes to the multi-bagger, you want to make sure the culture inside the company and they don't use a lot of debt. And the other thing I'd add to, um, to um, Monish's comment, they don't need a lot of capital. So when we have our cash flow statement here, free cash flow is cash from operations less your capital expenditures. If capital expenditures are a big percentage of cash from operations, avoid it. It's going to take too much. You want to find companies that don't require a big ton of capital to keep growing. Like cruise lines. I have a bet on Carnival Cruise, but it's a short-term bet. I'm not betting on Carnival Cruise for the very, very long run. I'm betting on it short-term till things get back to normal. So these things like that. But most importantly, the fourth one is, if all the first three are, are, are good and the fourth one's bad, which is price, you're not buying it anyhow. So it's kind of like this layer. Like, okay, is the first one good? Great, next one. Second one good? Great. Third one good? Nope. Any point along the way, if it's a no, you move on. And that's a key thing here. And we have, we have return on equity on our software here. We do have return on equity in our software. So this is return on equity for WBD, Warner Brothers um, Digital. Okay, let's keep going. We have about a minute left on this one. The interesting thing is that uh, and 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 all all value investing, there are a couple of data points. You know, John Templeton used to say that the very best value investor or analyst will be wrong one out of three times. Like thirty three percent error rate is the lowest error rate for the very best practitioner of the art. If you were a kind of brain surgeon and you had even a 3% error rate, there might not be too many people coming to you for brain surgery. <laughs> but I think in terms of value investing, you could be wrong half the time. And I think I've probably been wrong close to half the time and still end up with a phenomenal track record. So, and especially if you focus on the multi-baggers, you know, companies that would go up 10X or 100X, Basically, in a lifetime of investing, if you end up, ended up finding just two or three or four hundred baggers at the age that you're at right now, that's all you need. In many cases, if you just found one, that might be all you need. And so we have all this time. So... It's interesting. Charlie Munger, I, I think in Richer, Wiser, Happier or Psychology of Money, they talked about how Munger had once said, apart from a few of our portfolio, a few of our companies that did huge, we were about average. But we found a few that really, really had long, high tail, really, you know, in, in terms of the bell curve, they found a few that were right over here. But he's like, overall, we basically did this and they avoided these. So that's the key to investing. And that's something that I... I struggle with because I like both. I like finding the one-offs and I also like finding, and by the way, Warren Buffett does one-offs. He has a bet on Activision Blizzard being taken over by Microsoft. He's doing an arbitrage play. Doesn't mean he just avoids that. Back in the 07, 08 crisis, he lent money to Goldman at a very good rate of return. It was $10 billion. Okay, doesn't mean he's going to avoid those. But if he's going to deploy capital, big time capital, he's trying to find the ones that he can get multi-baggers on. And like he said, and Moses said, if you buy a company and you're wrong and it's not a 10 bagger, it's a three bagger over 10 or 15 years, you're still going to do well. And that's the key to value investing. Even when you're wrong, you're not wrong by much. That's what margin of safety is. That's the key to margin of safety. The higher your margin of safety, the more likely you are to do well, even during bad times. And guess what? I have changed my views a lot on value investing. I still enjoy finding the one-offs like, hey, this company is selling for 20. I think it should be a $40 company, but I don't want to own it forever. But there's also the part of, I want to find companies at great prices that I love that I want to own forever. And that's the key to it. So if you like this, we do tons of different videos, two or three videos a day, a lot of reaction videos. You must subscribe to the channel. I absolutely implore you to, because if you watch four or five of our videos, you will have a better understanding of investing. Just under, just look at how much you probably understand it now just by watching this video. Thanks for your time. There are three things that you absolutely need in order to be a successful investor. The proper mindset, the proper emotion, and the proper process. Which ones are the most important? 